Hello everybody, welcome to week two of the Rails Dispatch. This week we're going to be talking about managing your gem dependencies as part of your Rails application. Gem dependency management has changed a bunch in Rails 3 and today we're going to be talking about how you can use Bundler to manage your dependencies. First, let's install Rails. Gem install Rails minus minus pre. This is going to install all the Rails gems as well as all Rails' dependencies using the normal RubyGems process. Next, let's create our app, Rails New App, and go into the directory, CD New App. If you try to start the Rails server using Rails S, you'll find that there's a missing dependency here, couldn't find SQLite 3 Ruby. If we go into our application, we'll see a new file called the gem file, which is a list of all of our dependencies, and we'll see here that the SQLite 3 Ruby gem is listed as a requirement. One quick way of solving this problem is just to do gem install SQLite 3 Ruby, hit enter, and we'll get SQLite 3 Ruby installed, and the Rails application should boot just fine. So if we type in Rails S for Rails server, we should see that the Rails server boots as expected. And if we go into the browser and type in localhost 3000, we should see the normal Rails boot up screen. Installing the gems manually is going to get us going, but when the application becomes bigger, we're going to want an automated process to install all the gems for an application. Bundle install will look for any gems that you don't have already installed and get them. In this case, there's nothing left, everything works, so Bundler just reports that everything is used from system gems. Next, we're going to add some test time dependencies, so we'll just go at the bottom here and comment in the group test with the gem webrat. This just specifies that webrat is a test time dependency. If we run bundle install, Bundler recalculates all the dependencies and goes and installs everything that we need. First it fetches the source index from RubyGems and then it, you'll see that it installs everything that's needed. Most of the gems are already present, but uh, WebRat requires Nokogiri 1.4.1, so it goes installs it, installs any native extensions, and it installs WebRat and tells you that the bundle is complete. Now, what if we have a dependency on a specific version of Nokogiri, in this case 1.4.0? If we make the modification, Bundler is going to check to make sure that WebRat still is going to work against that version of Nokogiri. In this case, version of WebRat that we already have installed, 0.7, actually runs against Nokogiri 1.4.0. So you'll see that Bundler happily installs everything and installs the new version of Nokogiri. And once it's done installing the native extension, it just keeps WebRat as before. At any point, you can ask Bundler for the list of gems available for the current application with Bundle Show. You'll get some basic information about the gems as well. Now, what if we actually need Nokogiri 1.1.0? While the current version of WebRat doesn't actually support that version of Nokogiri, if we run bundle install, Bundler recalculates the dependency graph and finds that WebRat 0.4.1 actually successfully runs against that version of Nokogiri. If we go back and eliminate that restriction, comment out that Nokogiri gem, we'll find that Bundler once again is able to use WebRat 0.7.0, except this time it doesn't bother to install everything since everything has already been installed previously. Since we're using the most recent Rails beta, we're going to need to use devise from git. We'll point devise at the GitHub repo, git colon slash slash github.com slash platforma tech slash devise. And then we can go back into the command line and type in bundle install. And this time we'll see that in addition to fetching from RubyForge, uh, Bundler is updating the device repo itself, installing all the gems, most of which are already installed. And once it's complete, we're back at the command line again. We can run Rails G for generator. And then Rails will spit out a list of the generators, which is now going to include the generators provided by device. We'll run the device install generator, Rails G device install. And it'll spit out the normal stuff that device tells you when you install the uh, plugin. Next, we'll run Rails G device user. That's just device setting up the user model, and it does its normal thing. And now we have some basic uh, authentication setup. If we go back and run the Rails server, it'll boot up just as usual. And if we go into the web browser and we go to slash users slash sign up we'll see that whoops we forgot to run the migration so let's go back to the command line get out of the server run rake db migrate 
and it's gonna migrate. Note that we don't have to do anything special here because we're using Bundler. Uh, the migration runs as usual. If we restart up the server, and once again, go back into the web browser, once it's started up, we'll find that Devise is working as expected. Just refresh here and everything's working great. Now let's say I'm working on Rails locally on my machine and I wanna be able to use the code that's actually on my machine instead of pointing at Git repo or pointing at a local gem. And I can use the path option to a gem. Now let me go into the version of Rails that I'm using and I'll just put at the beginning of the server, starting up my awesome server. We just want to show that whenever we start the server. Now we can just run Rails S. We don't have to do any installation since we already have the code in our machine. And you see that it says starting up my awesome server. In order to check whether or not the dependencies are satisfied at any given point, you can run bundle check and it will tell you yes or no, whether or not you have the dependencies satisfied here. Yeah, we do. You can also run bundle show at any given point just to get a list of all the gems that are included in your application. Now you may at some point want to get an update of all the gems that are in your bundle just to check to see if there's anything new remotely and if you run bundle install at any point it'll go update any of the remotes like the git repo like rubyforge and just install anything new that happens to exist. In this case there's nothing new we just ran this a second ago but you can run that command just to get the update as you need it. Path can be very useful for gems that you're developing on your local machine but it's not very shareable so let's remove it and you'll note that you can run Rails S Again, without running bundle install since the Rails gem that we had installed before is still on our system. So we run Rails S, everything works just fantastic. And then we can run bundle show again and we'll see that now the Rails gem is uh, 3.0 beta 3 without the path specification. Uh, we can run bundle show against WebRat, a specific gem, and it will tell us where the gem is located. In this case, it's buried deep inside of my RVM. We can also run bundle open WebRat, and that will open it in our editor, which in this case is TextMate, and you can see it's the full WebRat. You can see all the files and such. Bundler also allows you to snapshot all the gems that are in use at a particular point using a command called bundle lock. Bundle lock just remembers all the specific gems, including dependencies that were used. If we run bundle show, we still get all the same stuff as we had before, only this time it's using the snapshot. If we go into our gem file and make a modification like 3.0 beta 2 and try to start the server, Bundler helpfully tells you that you've changed the gem file and you probably want to rerun bundle lock to relock the repo. If we make the change again and run Rails S, everything works great. Bundler only cares that you don't make any changes to the gem file that are inconsistent with your snapshot. Sometimes we want to make actual changes to our gem file as a result of ongoing application development even when our snapshot is in place. In this case, we're going to go in and change Nokogiri back to using Nokogiri 1.4.0 as opposed to 1.4.1 that WebRat would normally use. If we run bundle install, we're going to get the same kind of error as we got before. It's going to tell us that well, we've modified the gem file after locking. We can run bundle install minus minus relock to unlock the gem file, run the installation process again, and then relock once we're done. So we'll see that it's going to go do all the normal stuff and then get Nokogiri 1.4.0. If you go look at the snapshot file, which you don't need to, you'll see that it has a list of all the dependencies that you specified as well as the fully resolved set of dependencies and the sources that we've listed. Let's check this repository out on a brand new machine. As you can see, there's no gems. We're gonna to need to install Bundler first before we can do anything. And because of the fact that this repository is locked, when we actually run bundle install, we're gonna get all the gems at the same versions as when we last snapshotted this repository. And you can see it installs them one at a time from the RubyGems repository and whatever other sources we've specified, such as the device Git repository. And it basically just goes through all of them through the normal installation process. And you can be sure that the right versions of everything are going to be installed. And as you can see, it installs native extensions and whatever else that might be needed. In a locked repository, if you have all the gems already on your system, bundle install is extremely fast as it just checks to make sure everything's there and it's done. You can get more information on the bundler at gembundler.com, including information on how to use it with Rails 2.3 and other setups. Thank you for listening.